Our first candidate is a former governor from Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, our first video will be Governor Jeb Bush explaining how his presidency would uniquely bring opportunity for all and favoritism to none. The question is how do we create an America where there's opportunity for all and favoritism for none? The way we do that is to create high sustained economic growth. 1.3 million new jobs were created during the time that I was governor. Income rose in people's pockets. I committed to building the best business climate possible so that small businesses could create the jobs that would allow people to rise up. And I created the first statewide voucher program. I created the second statewide voucher program. And I created the third statewide voucher program. We dramatically reform our tax code by lowering rates and eliminating all of the crony capitalism embedded in our tax code. Taxes should be lower, simpler, fair, and clear. We need to shift power away from Washington, D.C. as it relates to regulations. Our government, particularly in Washington, D.C., makes it hard for people to rise up, which is why I'm for a balanced budget amendment line item veto power. We need transparency. I think every time a lobbyist meets with an elected official, it ought to be online in 48 hours. My plan works whether you're on Main Street or Wall Street. No special favors, no special breaks. Reforming how Washington works, combined with high sustained economic growth, is the best way to create opportunity for all. And we will assure that our children and grandchildren will have more opportunities than what we have. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Governor Jeb Bush. Thank you all. Governor Good afternoon. Bush, your first question will come from Heather. I got into politics because I felt like my own party was part of the problem in Washington. Spending was up, government was bigger, and we were bailing out Wall Street. You've talked with passion about guaranteeing a right to rise and how conservative ideas work for everyone. Today, it seems like the only people who get to rise are the well-connected. How do you plan to change that? Great question. First of all, I've had the practice of doing it, being governor of the state of Florida, where According to Fox Business, of all the candidates running for president that have been a governor, I cut spending the most. We had a basic belief that government income should grow far less than personal income. And every budget I submitted and every budget I signed, all of them balanced, had that principle applied. So at the end of eight years, government was smaller as it related to the size and scope of people's income. We had $1,500. More, more money in people's pockets, families in Florida, because of that. We challenged everything. I disrupted the old order, and that's what we need to do in Washington, D.C. If you want to create an environment where people have a chance to rise up, you've got to deal with crony capitalism, the fact that everything's all lobbied up. A tax code now has so much, so many expenditures and carve-outs and credits. We need a simple code. I've proposed this 10 days ago a code that lowers the rates, the corporate rate to 20%, the lowest in the industrialized world instead of the highest, where we eliminate all of the deductions and carve-outs. Let people decide, let businesses pursue their, their success their own way. And that's the way you do it. We lower personal rates as well and put a cap on expenditures or deductions. We also eliminated, by the way, this will be important not just for Washington, but we eliminated state and local tax deductions. So, so small government states, communities like South Carolina and Florida, aren't subsidizing California and New York and Illinois. This is the way you do it. You shift power back to families, back to communities to let them make decisions. In the case of Florida, when we did this, our economy grew at 4.4%, about double the rate that we're, we're, we're living in, with now. Our, we had 4.4% growth, government grew at half that rate. We were one of two states to become AAA bond rated. Compare that to the sorry state of affairs in Washington, D.C., where we're the, for the first time in American history, we had a credit downgrade. You can do this if you're serious about applying conservative principles across the board, and that's what I did. I was a disruptor in Tallahassee, and I'll be a disruptor in Washington, D.C. We need a line item veto power for the, for the government. They called me Vito Corleone when I was governor of Florida for good reason, because I vetoed 2,500 separate line items in the budget, totaling $2 billion. 
We need to have a balanced budget amendment. Every time a lobbyist meets with an elected official in Washington, there ought to be, in 24 hours, there ought to be some notice of it. If an elected official doesn't show up to work, they ought to have their pay deducted like everybody else in America. You can change, you can change the culture, and then you can start fixing the big things that are holding us back, how we tax, how we regulate, embracing the energy revolution, fixing the things that will allow us to grow at a rate that will lift everybody's spirits. Governor Bush, let's, let's stick on the issue of spending. Over the last 15 years, the federal budget has doubled from $1.9 trillion to this year an estimated $3.8 trillion. Can you commit that as president, the size of government relative to the economy will shrink under your presidency? And specifically with regards to the discretionary budget, are there any specific programs that you'd cut? Sure. Well, first of all, I think we ought to shift as much of these things, block grant them back to the states. So the biggest non-discretionary, so-called non-discretionary spending, by the way, Mike, why do we call these things discretionary and non-discretionary to start with? That's kind of a trap to begin with, isn't it? Shouldn't we have a family budget in Washington, D.C.? Shouldn't we start with the notion that you take what you have, you spend what you have? The budget in Washington that starts like this, that's the base budget. It grows automatically. Maybe we should have a zero-based budgeting approach where there is no difference between discretionary and non-discretionary. So here's, here's the idea. Medicaid, one of the largest spending items in the, in, in the federal budget. It's non-discretionary because it's an entitlement. Fine, why don't we block grant it back to the states? Let Governor Haley pick how she wants to create an insurance program for the poor. In Florida, I did that. We said we'll take this money at a far lower rate of growth, 2% instead of 6 or 7%, and we created our own Medicaid program that the beneficiaries liked a lot more. They, they got to choose plans. They got benefits when they could take the, plan, the premium and go to a private provider. If they made the healthy lifestyle decisions, they got additional monies to continue to do healthy lifestyle things. And the net result was we saved a lot of money for the government, outcomes were better, and people had choices and they were empowered to make that, those kind of choices. That's the better approach. Across the board, we should be, we should be doing that. But there's a lot of programs inside of Washington that don't need to go back to, they ought to be eliminated. The EDA, there's a whole alphabet soup of things inside of the Department of Commerce. It worked maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, but in this dynamic economy that we're living in, we don't have to have government support for economic development. It's kind of an oxymoron. All of the Department of Energy grants for trying to pick winners and losers in the energy market, that really worked out well. Solyndra and every other one, we should eliminate all of that kind of spending and focus on... <laughs> frankly, if you had to pick the one thing, and I hope, I hope you guys support this, in South Carolina, the most veteran-friendly state other than maybe Florida, I hope that you would say that we need to support our veterans and support our military and support our counterintelligence capabilities. That is where we should be spending our money and reforming the things that, that create the huge out-year cost, our entitlement problems, and then all the rest of it should be challenged in a zero-based budgeting kind of way. That's what I think is the proper approach to doing this. And wherever possible, let's apply the Tenth Amendment again the right way. Let's shift power back to the states and let them decide how they build their roads, how they educate their kids, how they provide social welfare system around the people that truly need it. Governor Bush, on several of the things you just mentioned, you might find that actually there's some people within your own party, especially in Washington, D.C., who disagree with you. What issue do you think, if you were elected president, you would most come in conflict with the Republican Party over? I can't, you know, we, the microphone, it's... What issue do you think you would most find yourself in conflict with congressional Republicans oh. with your own party in as president? I don't know. I think, I think people are quite comfortable with the old order there, and there, there's be a lot of uh, disruption. Some of the things I just described might, might come in conflict. Um, the XM Bank is an example of this. I don't, you know, it may have worked in the past, but again, we're in a different era. Our economy is different. We need to create a dynamic world. We don't have to have, and, and we need to tear down the barriers. The large businesses are going to do fine. What we need to do is to eliminate the barriers so that people, smaller businesses, can disrupt and innovate and challenge. And I, I want my party to be on the side of the disruptors, not on the side of the incumbents. So there will be people that 
support because of large corporations in their districts and things like that. They might be supportive of that, but the simple fact is, with presidential leadership, people will move in the direction of what a president does. And we've had, for the last six and a half painful years, we've had a president that has only tried to divide us, that doesn't believe in entrepreneurial capitalism, that believes that the progressive agenda from the top down works far better than the indigenous kind of organic way that America has always done better from the bottom up. But a president that comes committed to that, that believes in the future of our country, in a free society, people pursuing their dreams with a vengeance, believes in free market economics, I think there'll be lots of people that will follow. And we should have that kind of discussion now. I mean, there are people that have been elected to Congress who have done a good job fighting President Obama, but they've never actually passed a law. They've never done anything because there's ab, you know, abject gridlock. And that's quite dangerous. Look at the governors as the place to see how it should work. Governors that have Republican legislatures, governors that have mixed legislatures. And what you find is, because they have a balanced budget requirement, first and foremost, they have to pass a budget. And if you have to pass a budget, you have to prioritize. We should have that as a first priority. And every state in this country ought to be passing a balanced budget amendment. If the Washington won't do it, let's have a, Congress, a const constitutional convention to do it. If you had that, it would force everybody to forge consensus on how to find it. It wouldn't force raising taxes for those that are concerned about that. Not with me as president and Republicans in Congress. We're not going to raise taxes. We should be lowering taxes and reforming it to eliminate all of the carve-outs and the things that protect the incumbents. We could be growing at 4% per year, as far as the eye can see, if we applied the same principles that allowed us to grow at 4% per year when we were doing it. We haven't lost our ability to do it. We just haven't applied the right policies to make it happen. And that's what we should be focused on. I'm having a hard time hearing you here. Governor Bush, let's talk now about what you call the right to rise and religious liberty. Um, you spoke at the Liberty University commencement address, and then you said, with regard to the religious liberty, there's a choice between the little sisters of the poor and big brother. And in your 1990s book, uh, Profiles and Character, you said that one of the causes um, of America's social regression can be traced uh, to the collapse of civil society, those institutions, the family, church, that instill virtue. Can you talk about what you think the job of a president is vis-a-vis -vis promoting religious liberty, civil society, and virtue? Absolutely. Uh, this, is, this is a, if you talk about bottom-up politics, bottom up, a bottom-up society rather than a top-down society, you start with the institution of family. Because without that, the demands on government become overwhelming. Today in America, 42% of all the babies brought into the world today will be out of wedlock. A mom will be there, of course, but the dad, they may, you know, the dad may be part of the life, but is not, not the husband of the mom and may not be living there. A quarter of all children born today don't know who their dad has no relationship with their dad. And the net result of this, as we've seen this play out, is a dramatic change in our society. And the demands that exist because of this are overwhelming. If we want to get back to a, a, a society that is loving and compassionate and caring, I think restructuring, reorganizing family life, recognizing that single moms are hero heroic in their efforts, that we should, we should respect the fact that it is difficult to do this, but we ought to figure out ways to make sure that men can be involved in their child's life and men be reconnected with, their, with the moms that are, that are struggling. And we don't do that today. So how would we do it? Well, first, as a president, you lead. You talk about this in a way that is loving and draws people towards the cause of traditional family life being important. Secondly, you eliminate all of the barriers that exist right now in our welfare system for men to be engaged. Effectively, if you're, if you're a, a intact family, you can't receive the benefits. And the net result is that it basically perpetuates this. You trap people. Thirdly, we have a marriage penalty in, in, our, in, our, in our tax code. If someone wants to work as a spouse, the highest rate that they pay is the first dollar that they earn because they're part of their spouse's income. We should eliminate the marriage penalty by allowing spouses to have their own file, single filing, which would create a lot of economic opportunity and vitality in families. And as it relates to religious freedom, clearly the president has to express a view and fight for the view that Conscience is what religious freedom is about, not just going to church, as Hillary Clinton says, or just having a view of faith in your house. 
but acting on your sense of consciousness matters. Being in the public square, using your, the teachings of your creator to be able to improve the human condition, to act on your faith, is something that is part of our heritage as a country. And there are people on the left that want to push that away, and they're using the courts to try to do so. I, for one, believe that a tolerant big country like ours needs to protect religious freedom and religious conscience. It is the first freedom of our Constitution. And I think a major, great majority of Americans believe with it. I think, I think three quarters of Americans, if you express it the way I just did, will, will embrace that idea. And politics ought to be about that, drawing people towards our cause, having a conversation with them to believe like we believe that these things truly, truly matter. Great. Governor Bush, final question before Governor Haley comes up. Many demand cheap energy, but are unwilling to see its production in their own state. When you were governor of Florida, you supported a, a drilling moratorium off the coast of Florida. Our next question actually comes from Twitter, and they ask that you please provide details regarding energy. Sure. Well, as it relates to the, to the um, offshore drilling moratorium that existed in Florida, it was interesting because, and Governor Haley will appreciate this, for eight years I, I opposed the uh, drilling we, uh, the, you know, off, off the coast by 100 miles because we have, no disrespect, Governor, we have some pretty nice beaches. <laughs> and you've got to balance the economic interests with the environmental concerns, and, and that's what I did. No one ever came to my office and said, hey, the dangerous thing is to be 230 miles off the coast where you have deeper waters. That creates a bigger challenge. So that's a lesson learned, but the simple fact is that governors ought to have the right to decide these things. And in South Carolina, if you want to drill off the coast, fine. In Florida, if, the, if Governor Scott doesn't want to do it, fine. This should be a decision jointly made by the federal government and the states, but if the states are totally opposed to this, they ought to have the right to be able to not, not allow it to happen. And as it relates to energy in general, I think we could be energy secure within five years with North American resources. That means, that means approving the XL pipeline, for one. That means, that means wherever there is this consensus to expand leases on federal lands and federal waters, which right now there's been a dramatic decline in. That means having a tax code where you fully depreciate all investment in the first year to create a massive expenditure in our own country creating, creating a renaissance in energy. That means, that means totally focusing on this where natural gas is used in, in a very different, in all sorts of ways to expand its consumption because it's the lowest, most, lowest cost, most abundant source of energy in the world. If we do that, and it means also that we eliminate the export ban so that we export our oil to use it as a national security tool, tool and it frankly lowers our costs here by doing that. And it creates high wage jobs and hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in the real economy. Our energy sector is the one hope we have to be able to create a stronger and safer America and create high sustained economic growth at a far faster rate. And that's what we should be doing. We ought to be figuring out how do we create 4% growth? How do we lift people out of poverty? How do we create higher wages for the great middle of our country instead of declining disposable income? The energy sector is a place where that will happen more often than not. Thank you. And I have to tell everyone that um, Jeb is, I consider, a very dear friend. And the reason I do is because when I was Nikki Who, running for governor, and no one knew who I was, I saw him at this candidate forum. And I said, I don't even have 3% of the polls. No, no one will support me. I can't, I can't pick up the phone and no one will answer. And he said, get out of the office. Quit listening to the consultants. Shake every hand and tell them what you care about. And he made it all about grassroots. And for that, I will forever be thank you. thankful. So thank you very, very much. So Jeb has been one of those other governors that's been great to ask advice to. And South Carolina has not always been at the top and is still struggling when it comes to education. And so I had called him and said, what advice can you save me? Because he was one of the first governors to acknowledge education, but a conservative governor to acknowledge education. He said, you need reading coaches. He said, you need technology. And above all, don't pass any kids that can't read by the third grade.
Deb, the reason I want to bring this up is because I think there's also, as much as we've worked together on education, South Carolinians have had an issue with Common Core. Yep. And so I'd like to ask you, explain to us what your thought process was through Common Core and where you see it going. Well, Common Core was started after I left as governor. I'm for higher standards, and Common Core standards are higher than the standards that exist. And so if South Carolina, hang on a second, hang on a second, let me finish. I'm, you're going to like the ending of this story. Come on. If, if South Carolina wants to get out of Common Core standards, great. Just make sure the standards that you apply are higher than the ones you had before you had Common Core. The standards matter. Accountability matters around them matters. School choice matters. It's the whole approach. No standards would yield bad results, and that's what we have. In South Carolina and Florida, about a third of our kids are college and or career ready. Here's what I'm not for. What I'm not for is the federal government having any say about any aspects of content, curriculum, or standards. This should be a South Carolina decision. And here's the results, Governor, when we did this, when we applied higher standards prior to Common Core, robust accountability, the most ambitious school choice programs in the country, when we eliminated social promotion in third grade, which is what we did, Florida has led the nation in learning gains. It's a fact. Our kids have grown at a faster rate in terms of their learning than any, we started at a low base. We were 50th out of 50 in graduation rate. We're now at the national average. African-American kids, low-income kids, kids with learning disabilities, Hispanic kids, all kids in Florida have seen greater gains than any other state in the country. It is a fact. So accountability and standards along with school choice matters. It matters what, t what kids are learning. If you have low expectations for kids, you'll get that result. Do you think it's appropriate that a third of our kids are college and or career ready when they graduate from high school? It is shameful. We need to elevate this debate to get to the point where it, where it really matters. If kids are not ready to go to college or get a job by the time we, f we finish high school, what's their life gonna look like? What kind of life will they have? A life of purpose and meaning? I don't believe so. And so this should be a priority as it is with Governor Haley and any governor, this should be their first priority to assure that you transform the system to make sure that children are ready to go pursue their dreams as they see fit. And our country is lagging behind. We are 15th in the, in the world right now in terms of college attainment rates. We were number one just 20 years ago. Who's fooling who? Well, and I think, Jeb, that that's the reason we care about it is because we're trying to do all these made in America jobs but we want our kids doing them. We want to make sure that our kids can do this. So when it comes to issues that governors face, and I appreciate it because you've been a governor, you know what it's like to have Washington push on you. When it comes to health care, when it comes to education, when it comes to regulations, will you allow states to make those decisions first or will you try and push those through by the federal government? <laughs> you know what the answer to that is. So on education, I'll give you an example. Instead of imposing anything on states on how to do things. If you wanted to create a, the largest, like Nevada just did the ESA, Education Savings Account, largest voucher program if it's fully implemented in the country. Every child can go to a private school. Their parents can send their kids to a private school, irrespective of income. It's a big, big darn deal. If they could take the monies that go to Title I monies for low-income kids and ESE monies for the learning disabled kids and the early childhood monies uh, education monies and send that down as a block grant to Brian Sandoval, the governor of Nevada, he should have that right to take that money and expand these state-driven programs because they're going to yield rising student achievement. And if you want to do the same thing, you should have that, that flexibility. The government ought to give you that flexibility. And when I'm elected president, that's exactly what I will propose. L liberate this stuff. Let, let the, this woman here knows more about education than anybody in Washington, D.C. And that's what we should be focusing on, supporting the reformers in our, in, our, in our country and have trust people in the states to be able to do what they know how to do. Last thing I want to ask, just on a personal note, on one side, you look and this entire arena loves your family, loves your family, and is so thankful for the service that they've given um, to our Personally, for you, how hard has it been to have to be part of this beloved family, but yet also watch your family get criticized and separate yourself from all of that? <laughs> well, 
I'm used to the criticism because uh, I've watched my dad and my brother be, be president, and they got the bark scraped off of them every day by the left. That's what they did. That's how they roll. The left just demonizes everybody because their ideas are dead. Have you seen an interesting idea from the left recently? So what do they do? They demonize. I'm used to this. That's not a problem at all. I'm totally uh, comfortable with that. My challenge and my, my, not dilemma at all, but my opportunity is to share the Jeb story. It's one of accomplishment as it relates to being a governor. I don't have to talk about things. I don't have to file an amendment and call it success. I'm not going to say what I've done uh, and, and not back it up with anything. I got to be governor like you, which means I cut taxes. I shrunk the government workforce by 11%. I turned the whole system upside down. We created the most meaningful reforms in education. We privatized the child welfare system. You go across the board in terms of policy, and people look to Florida. That story, combined with my policies that I want to bring to the country going forward and the reforms that Washington needs, is my path to success. And thank you for always being as we go forward. Everybody give it up for Governor Bush. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the night.